turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10. <clears throat> well done to the team last week, um, Anna and Alex and all the A's. We come in batches, right? M's and A's and all these things. So uh, I just, as we've traveled around, um, so aware of this truth. And I love what we sang, our God reigns. We've got to remind ourselves of that sometimes. We look at what's going on in our world, and we as the people of God remind ourselves God is sovereign. And Isaiah chapter 40 verse 10, um, just a shout out to Sullivan and Lesh. Uh, we are thinking of you guys as well. They, uh, they've lost a family member over the weekend, and so our prayers are with you. Um, Isaiah 40 verse 10 says, See... The sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him, and see his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. I want to declare, I want to speak prophetically this morning, I want to call it out that God is about to reward those who diligently seek him. God is about to bring reward for faithfulness. God is about to bring reward for walking in his ways. God is about to break out in a new way. And what he wants us to do is to see that he is sovereign, that nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is too hard for God. In fact, when things begin to go worse, that's when God is at his greatest. That's when he just shows off his incredible power. And this morning, I want to begin to call it out over us as City Life. I want to begin to call it out over your individual life that God is about to reward those who diligently seek Him. This is what faith is. When He was bringing His people out of Egypt, it seemed like things were getting worse before they got better. But God was going to show off His power like, like never before. And... Uh, We've, I also feel like it's a time to remind ourselves of the providence of God. In Genesis chapter 50 verse 19, Joseph says to his brothers, don't be afraid. Can you say, don't be afraid? Am I in the place of God, he says. That by that he recognizes God is the one that's in the place of sovereignty. God is the only one that can fill that position. And he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives cannot declare, cannot declare whatever has been meant to harm and to, to bring destruction. God is intending to use it to bring good. And God is about to bring in unsaved people like we have not seen before. There is a harvest that is so ready. There is a hot, God is about to, to break into unsaved people's lives and reveal himself to them in a powerful way that will transform their lives. Not information, transformation and revelation. And so we have, been, we have been saying there are three truths that God wants us to guard. Number one, God is, is limited. That is not true. We've, uh, we've crossed that out. We understand that that is under attack right now. And the, no, the reason I know it's under attack is because more and more people, if you don't believe that God is not limited, you begin to lean on your own strength more. And when you do that, you get tired more. And you run out of strength more. And even young men like me and Mike and Sean... Grow weary and tired. I don't care how strong you are, you're not strong enough. Even young men grow weary and tired. But those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. God is not limited. God does not run out of strength. God doesn't run out of love. God doesn't run out of patience. God doesn't run out of power. God is not limited. Oh, I don't want to see myself preaching at myself from Facebook. The second thing that I feel is just so under attack right now is the Word of God. Um, the, this reasoning that the Word of God somehow doesn't apply. I want to say that if you will obey the Word in this season, you will see phenomenal results. 
phenomenal results because we live in an age of reason where people have reasoned away why the word of God doesn't apply. But I say to those who are willing to obey the word of God, there will be great rewards because God blesses obedience. And there's no excuse valid enough to, to explain away the word of God. And thirdly, this truth that you are somehow excluded from the plan of God. Not true. Not true. Not true. You are so key in God's plan. Don't write yourself off. It doesn't matter what your past or your history or your failures or your last season is. You are part of God's plan. And what you do does make a difference. So will you close your eyes for a moment? And we're not going to pray. I want you cl close your eyes. Yeah, that's for real. You can close them now. I want you to imagine. Use your imagination. And imagine God's wildest plan for your life personally. What does that look like? If there were no limits. If there were no restrictions. God's wildest plan. You living out your wildest dream in God. What does that look like? Then I want you to begin to imagine God's wildest dream for city life. For His church. What would that look like? Okay, you can open your eyes. If the person next to you's eyes are still closed, just like, hey. Can I say that God's dream for you and for our church looks nothing like what you've just imagined? Exceedingly, abundantly more than what you've just imagined. That's God's plan. And it's, it's written in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work in us. You see, we, we're coming out of a season of restrictions and cutting back and smaller and, and scale down. And, 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 and I want to say that God prophetically is saying, don't forget he is sovereign. The dream he has is still there. And we need to make sure that we continue to dream the dreams that God dreams for our own life, for the church, and for, for the world we live in. I like the NLT. It says, Now all glory to God who is able through His mighty power at work within us. Now guess how God is going to do immeasurably, imagine more than what we can even think of. How is He going to do it? His power that's at work in us. That's a phenomenal thought. It's not going to be somewhere out there, God's going to do something. No, it's in us and through us. God is going to do more than what you just imagined. That's pretty exciting. The Message Bible puts it this way. God can do anything. God can do anything. You know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His Spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. We have some super exciting days that lie ahead. Come on. I mean, we, the best is still ahead. I'm a firm believer of that. God's glory will cover the earth as the waters cover the earth. That's how God's glory from, from, from one side of the globe to the rest, the glory of God is going to be poured out upon the earth. And I'm, I'm telling you, this is not some pipe dream. This is through God's mighty power working in you and me. We're part of that dream. And I can see you are super excited. So just hold yourself back. There is a seatbelt on your chair. You just got to buckle up and... <laughs> Someone's moved closer to the front. Um, man, I, I, I just feel like God this morning prophetically wants to declare some of these things. We have to speak them out. We have to say them. We have to declare them. I, I, I'm aware of what's going on. 
well aware. I was in a prayer meeting with about 25 leaders of churches somewhere this week in town. And guys were just like, like a battle zone. I'm aware of what's going on with the economy. I'm, a, I'm aware of what's going on with the politics. I'm aware of that. I'm aware people have lost lives and tragedy. I'm aware, but I'm telling you, God is sovereign. And if you're still breathing, you're part of the plan of God, and it's a glorious plan. And the church will stand because He can make her stand. So I've been reading this, and I, I'm not going to be too long. Please help us, Lord. Um, but I've just been thinking about my, my, the Bible and reading when does God actually begin to talk about His people collectively beginning to walk into the promises that He gives them? And it's in Joshua, right? You read Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, but there are five books before Joshua. And I'm not claiming to, like, this is unlocking the Bible like it's in a specific order or anything. But I feel there are five truths from those five books that if we don't understand them, we're not going to be able to walk into the promises of God. It's amazing how God creates a nation, from one man, he, ma he makes a nation through a promise and he works with that nation and, and that nation goes into a time of slavery and tragedy but he, he says to Abraham, for 400 years this is going to happen and then I'm going to bring them out and I'm going to do stuff with them and then they going to begin to walk into the promises I've made. All of them, a whole nation are going to see it. And so I believe, like, um, I believe the inheritance God has for His church is massive. Like Psalm chapter 2, verse 8 says, Ask of me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Please, let's not make God's dream smaller than it is. The nations have been promised to Jesus. We were sitting with a, 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 a small group of preachers yesterday talking about preaching and, and we're reading from Romans, how will they uh, uh, believe unless they hear and how will they hear unless someone preaches and how will someone preach unless they are sent and I was saying to them, how are we going to expect the whole world to get saved if we're expecting everyone to come into a room like a meeting like this? How are we going to reach them? No, every one of you are a preacher and I was firing them up. Because there are people listening to you, and how will they get saved? God has chosen through the preaching of the word, the declaration of the gospel to save people. How will the nations get saved? If we truly believe the nations is His inheritance, friends, we need every single one of us ready and prepared and walking into the inheritance of God. Amen. I want to say that it's an inheritance. Which means we don't earn it. We don't work for it. You receive it because it's willed to you. And by the death of someone, it comes to you. But like any inheritance, there are conditions to that will. For example, you, you have to be 21 or whatever is stated in the will. That's the conditions for you to walk into the inheritance. And so those five books, Genesis Thank you. Okay. For the guys online, through the masks, we did hear what was. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis. Remember, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm just trying to prophetically stir us about the dream that God has for us. And I'm saying like, yo, man, I know the last season has been restrict, cut back, hold back, cover up, stand, stand back. But I'm saying I'm beginning to proclaim over the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's time for us to begin to dream again. And it's time for us to begin to move towards the promises of God. And not because we deserve it, or we're so great, or we're going to do it, or this is our moment to shine. No, because God is sovereign. And God's plan still stands for the world. <clears throat> I feel that people that walk into, into their inheritance understand their genesis. And genesis means origin. And that means God's original, original intention for mankind. You know what I find? If you begin to claim an inheritance without understanding the origin, you actually become very self-centered. 
Can I say that again? For the church or our Christianity to be everything, about everything we inherit without remembering that it all started with God, we become very self-centered. And we think it's all about us and we put ourselves in the middle of it when actually in the beginning, God... It all starts with God. He's the author of our faith. He's the perfecter of our faith. He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. He started the church. He created the world. It's all about, it all starts with God. And if you don't get your genesis correctly, you become self-centered. And I, and I, and I want to say to the church of Jesus Christ, it's not all about us. I know it's been a series of, of, of events that have caused us to maybe self-preserve and to, to look after. And, and I believe God wants me to be a good steward of myself. I don't believe God is a, um, you know, what's the word say this? Like I have to suffer to prove anything. I avoid suffering if I can. Sorry. You might have thought more of me than you, you did. But I avoid it if I can. I understand there's some that you can't avoid in following Jesus. So why did I say that? Okay. <laughs> Jeez. Thank you, Ali. <laughs> yeah, so I think what we've got to remember, okay. So in that season, we often want to be the church who says, Lord, what's in it for me? What promises are there for me? I'm, I'm battling, I'm struggling, I'm suffering. Lord, what about me? But you know how this works. You put the kingdom first. And everything else is added unto you. Why is it like that? Because in the beginning was God. It started with God. God created me. I belong to God. He's the one that saved me. And you, you see that all the promises from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Moses, all that period, it's the promise of God that starts with God that leads to Joshua chapter 1. What about Exodus? Exodus, you know what the word Exodus means, right? Departure. A departure. And I want to say people who, I think as the church, if we don't understand our genesis, that it started with God, we become self-centered. But secondly, if we don't do an Exodus well, a departure well, it will stop us from walking into our inheritance. <clears throat> uh, did we show Colossians under Genesis, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16? I've just picked from Colossians. Um, everything was created through him and for him. We see that Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, Genesis 1, in the beginning God created. So with Exodus we see Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. Can you say transferred? You see, he rescues in Exodus. There's a rescuing and then there's a transferring. And that means I have to, through the blood of Jesus, I have to depart. I have to depart well. What does that mean? I depart in the direction that my life is going. I'm going to move from what I used to live for and begin to live in the direction of what the promises of God are. I depart in my thinking. Thank you, Marcel. Amen. <laughs> I have to depart with my lifestyle. I have to depart from the pain. Can I say that? And the trauma of slavery. And I want to say we have been through some painful things. I tell you, I said with people, we have faced some tragedy. But here's the thing. We can't stay there. If we're going to walk into the inheritance of God, we can't stay there. We have to again do, we have to exodus again. We have to depart again and move on towards the promises of God. And we're not going to walk in the inheritance of God if we stay there. And you know that you can get stuck again. Your attitudes can cause you to be stuck again in the wilderness for 40 years. You departed, but then you have to keep on departing. Does that make sense to you? And some people are stuck and I'm saying, like, friends, if we're going to walk into the promises of God, if we're going to walk into the inheritance of God, maybe we need to leave some things behind and set course again for the promises that God has made over our life. We have to depart again 
And our attitude and our lifestyle and our decisions has to shift once again. So we can get on our way towards what God has promised. Are you Exodusing? Are you Genesising? Are you Leviticusing? That sounded like kissing. Yeah. <laughs> no kissing. Kissing. Leviticus is this purpose of God for saving us is, is to serve Him. It's priesting. And I've, yo, this is so encouraging for me, honestly. This is so encouraging for me because if you want to see the inheritance of God in your life, you've got to devote yourself to serve Jesus. You're not just saved to be saved. You're not just departing so you can move away from the pain and the trauma of slavery and everything else. You, you have a purpose, and that purpose is to priest. It's to serve. If you read Exodus, uh, God says, you will be a kingdom of priests for me. And so Leviticus is all about priesting. And 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says, um, but you are not like that, for you are chosen people. You are a royal your royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Wow. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for He called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. You know, in Exodus 19 verse 5, God says this, If you will obey me fully, keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you'll be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak. I, I find that those who give themselves to priesting are the ones who usually walk into the inheritance. Does that make sense to you? And I'm saying for us as the church of God, we have to understand our origin. We have to understand that sometimes we have to depart. Some of the things God has used in the past, He might not continue to use. We might have to depart. We might have to change. We have to, might have to change our attitude, the way we do things. But we're moving towards the promises of God. The purpose God saved us, friends, is to serve Him. Your most blessed life will be serving Jesus. There's no more blessed life than serving Jesus. Uh, and, you know, you can, you can look at um, the New Testament and see, bring a sacrifice of praise. Offer your body a living sacrifice. Don't neglect doing good and sharing, because with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Preaching the gospel, giving of our finances, our prayer, giving to the poor, all of these are, are sacrifices that New Testament priests ought to devote their lives to. Two more. Deuteronomy. You know what that means? Anyone? It's like, yes. What did he say? Repeated law. Oh, you saw on the slide. Well done. <laughs> yes, I thought like Arnold is going, woo! <laughs> it's Moses expounding on the commandments of God that God gave him in Exodus 20. And so Deuteronomy means like a, a, repeat, a repetition of the law. And, and that's what Moses does. He kind of expounds the law as he's about to not go into the promised land. He, he's emphasizing the importance of the Word of God in your life. And I want to say that we have to settle God's Word above everything else, whether it's convenient or it's not convenient. If we want to walk into the inheritance of God, our approach and our attitude, so people who don't Deuteronomy well are constantly finding reasons why not to apply the Word of God and obey it. Colossians 3.16, Let the Word of God dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Oh, Lord, I pray for us. I pray for the church, Lord, that we'd understand our origin. That we'd depart well. We would not get stuck. Lord, I pray that we would understand that you're calling us as a, a, out of all the earth. You're calling your people, believers, to serve you. 
No one else is qualified to do it, only us. And Lord, I pray for your word again, just to be front and center, that we'd obey it. If it says it, we do it. That that would be our approach in Jesus' name. And then the last one is numbers. And you know what numbers mean? Arnold? (laughs) So I'm just saying, you know, there's those five books before God speaks about His people starting to walk in an inheritance. And I think it's important to understand there are those truths. Why did God not straight go from Abraham to the promised land? Well, God wanted to establish identity. God wanted to show them, like, friends, you've got to keep moving on towards the promises of God. God was showing them that the call and the purpose of your life is to serve Jesus. If you're wondering, I'm telling you, the best life you can live, the best life, serving Jesus. And that's still true. The best. The best life, the way we walk towards the the promises of God is obeying the Word of God above all things. What does numbers mean? Numbers for me is just um, being counted. And I know a lot of people say like, oh, God doesn't count. No, God counts. Of course God counts. All the men, all the priests, everybody come. You be counted. What does that mean? Well, for me it means like, have I put up my hand? New Testament language for numbers is like this. And they devoted themselves. And they devoted themselves. Go and see, read your New New Testament and see what believers and followers of Jesus devoted themselves to. And so you see, that's a description of followers of Jesus. It's not something the church has to make you do. It's not the church or the leader's job to make you read your Bible. You devote yourself to that. You devote yourself to prayer. You devote yourself. Why? Because that's when you're saying, Lord, I'm willing to be counted. I put my hand up. I put myself on the team. Not waiting for someone to tell me, okay, now you've got a certificate. You can be on the team because you've met all the requirements. No, no, no. Come and be counted in the king and his kingdom. Lord, bring conviction, bring commitment, bring consistency to the people of God. And I tell you, we'll walk in the inheritance of God. Bring a devotion from our side, understanding that you are the one that took us out, rescued us and transferred us into the kingdom of light. And that you are moving us on towards your promises and towards your dream so that we can devote ourselves consistently, Lord, not only to serving you, Lord God, but to be counted in the king and his kingdom. Then, Joshua chapter 1. And this is the season I believe we're in. If we will do those five things well, this is what I believe God wants to do. Joshua chapter 1, as we land this. Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Isn't it amazing? Great men like Moses, like Abraham, like Isaac, like Jacob, never experienced this walking into. They were busy preparing a people to get into the promises of God. And then in Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of of Nun, so he had no mother, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, the Israelites. I will give you every place you put your foot or set your foot As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it. Um, to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. There is a change happening here. Where God says, you understand your origins, you've made your departure, you're priesting properly, you're being counted. 
it's time to go into the promises. And for me, this is very exciting because it says you and all these people. I believe God includes all his people walking into his promises. Your breakthrough is my breakthrough. My breakthrough is your breakthrough. Let's not think about this too individualistically. Does that make sense? When you pray for someone else's healing, why don't you pray for everybody's healing? When you pray for someone else's financial breakthrough, why don't you pray for all God's people's breakthrough? Because their breakthrough is our breakthrough. Our breakthrough is their breakthrough. I don't want just a breakthrough for myself. I want Because if all of us are going to break through, guess what? I'll be breaking through. You'll be breaking through. There's a get ready. There's a preparedness for what is to come. And I've spoken about that. There's a God-given inheritance. I am giving it to you. There's something God wants to give us that we can't, in, we can't earn it. We can't work for it. We can't create it. There's a, there's a river crossing that's required. You're going to cross the Jordan. For me, there's those two baptisms. Baptism of repentance, you come out of sin. Crossing the Jordan is a baptism of the Holy Spirit where God empowers us to walk into the inheritance. I believe God is wanna, he's wanting to pour out His Holy Spirit like never before over His church again. Refresh us. Empower us. You know, you read that story about how they crossed the Jordan and, and the first thing that happens, God says, circumcision. Deal with your heart. It's amazing. It's amazing how Rahab, unexpected people, somehow get part of the story of Jesus when there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Things happen, things change when God fills us with the Holy Spirit. Walls begin to come down. Cities break open. <laughs> it's like just supernatural miracles. Can you imagine? You're just walking around a city and the walls just collapse. I'm trusting God for that, man. Setting your foot in places that God has promised. I believe it's a season where, and maybe I'll ask you this question, when last have you done something in faith? When last have you stepped out and put your feet in something God has promised that you can't see yet, but you put your foot there? I'm not talking about surviving. Oh, Lord, I'm in a crisis. Please help. I've got faith. I'm talking about stepping out in faith into territory that God has promised. Come on. We have to put our feet there. There will be an extension of our territory. There will be a new authority. Do you see that? No one will be able to stand up against you. Uh, Where is Mary and the um, missionaries? Come, please. There will be a new authority. Um... You know, it's no good for God to give us authority if we don't exercise it. God's given the church authority for us to exercise that authority over the powers of darkness. When last have you exercised your God-given authority over the powers and principalities? Help someone come free. Tear down the, 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 the powers of darkness in our city, in our community. People are gripped by, by, by oppression. Eh? God's given us the authority to set the captives free. We need to move away. Please stand. Stand with me. A new presence of God. God says to Joshua, I will be with you I will be with you I'm trusting the Lord that his presence will be so strong in our lives that we would sometimes just walk into a room walk into a meeting and the atmosphere changes people are liberated 
board meeting, a company meeting, a, a school meeting, a, I tell you in every sector that the presence of God would so be on the shoulders of the priests of God, that God is with us, that there would be no doubt amongst the world that the presence of God is with his people. It will require courage and strength. You know, God says to Joshua, so we're saying, Lord, we, we want to do those five things well, but Lord, we, we want to dream about the inheritance you have for me, the inheritance you have for your church. And for that to happen, Lord God, we need to cross that Jordan River again. We need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit again. We need to step out with courage and faith again. I know it's been a time where we've been on the, on the back foot. We've been on the defensive. We've been on the protecting. We've, been, we've just been holding our ground. But I feel like God's saying, church, come on, step out again. Speak it. Prophesy it. Declare it. And I'm speaking it. I'm speaking it over dead bones. I'm speaking it over valleys of dry, dead bones. I'm saying, breath of God, come breathe let it come together again lord let let life enter it into it again lord raise up an army you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies lord do it again lord breathe your spirit again breath of god come i'm speaking it i'm speaking it over our honestly over the businesses in our church um, over over the businesses in our city, over the government, over, over education, over every area where there's death. I'm speaking it. I'm saying, Lord, let your breath come. Calling for the breath of God to come. And I'm going to keep speaking it. I'm going to keep declaring it. And there's a new authority in God that's going to come. It will require leadership. You see there how God says to Joshua, you will lead them into their inheritance. I feel like, friends, it's a, it's a season where we have to pay attention. To pay attention to leadership. We have to be led well. We have to lead well. There's an obedience that's required. It's amazing in Joel chapter 2. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit. After these things, I will pour out my spirit. After these things, I will pour out my spirit. Sons, daughters, old, young. They'll dream dreams. They'll see visions. They'll prophesy. It's, it's God, you know, He's sovereign. Eh? Some of the stuff that we've faced and we've been through, I don't know. People have struggled to, to get their minds around, how can God allow this? But I, I'm, I'm saying to you, God has been doing stuff. He's been getting our Genesis sorted. He's been getting our Exodus sorted again. He's been saying, you, church, you have to depart from some things. He's been getting our Leviticus sorted. Getting the, the Word of God back up there, Deuteronomy. And he's been saying, like, will you put your hand up in this next season? Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever it is you have for me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I say, yes. I put my hand up. I say, yes, Lord. Whatever it is you have, I say, yes, Lord, because I know it's what's going to be best for me. And then I believe it's a season. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. God will not indiscriminately, God will pour out his spirit again. Young people, old people, people we've disqualified in the seasons gone before. God will somehow pour out his spirit. And there'll be a new authority on his people. There'll be a new presence of God. There'll be a new way of leading. There'll be a new wine skin and a new wine that's poured out upon his people. Just open your hearts right now. Open your hearts for that. And yes, there's pain. And yes, it's going to require strength and courage for us to walk into this next season. But the Lord says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Maybe the devil's been pushing you around, bullying you, oppressing you. In your mind, you're, just, you're down and oppressed. And I want to say, man, I break the power of darkness over your life in the name of Jesus right now. I break the power. I break the chains. And I declare the life of God, the purposes of God over your life right now.
um, just before we worship Him again, um, just something that I felt while we were worshiping earlier, and um, it was just kind of also what Donnie was talking about. But um, you know, when we serve Jesus, it's serving Him from a place of Him being next to us um, and walking with Him. And sometimes serving Him is by giving our burdens to Him. That's how we serve Him, is by coming to Him and sitting at His feet and listening to His words. That's serving Him like Mary did. Um, and I just felt that scripture from Matthew 11 where it says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He served them, but he led by example. And um, just want to encourage us, as Donnie said, like God is taking us into a season where he will blow our minds. But he's wanting us in the season to be in readiness, waiting for him to speak. Wait, walking with him side by side, not burdened, not heavy. And again, God is reminding me and reminding you, let go, let go of everything. Free fall and know that he will catch you because that's who he is. It's a season, you know, where so many people are overwhelmed. They, they do carry so many burdens that when you come to them and ask them, can you do this one extra thing? It's almost like not another challenge. And, and it's so true what he's saying. You know, when they cross that Jordan, it wasn't more effort. It wasn't try harder. It was the Holy Spirit brought a new authority, brought a fresh presence of God, brought a freshness. And that's what we're talking about this morning. So Lord, we open our hearts to you. Holy Spirit, come. Work in us. Do a deep work in us. We just give you these moments, Lord, we know beyond what we can ask or imagine you want to do. And, and maybe, Lord God, right now that seems overwhelming. But Lord, when your Spirit comes, when you bring strength, supernatural courage and strength, Lord, we thank you that there is a lightness and there is an excitement and there is a joy and there is a power and there is a new, uh, uh, Lord, wine that comes and fills our hearts and refreshes us as we set our direction again upon the promises of God. Come and do that now, Lord. Come and do that now, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord.